One Hyde Park is a luxury apartment building in Knightsbridge, London. It was developed by the Candy Brothers, designed by Richard Rogers, and completed in 2009. The luxury apartments come with panic rooms, bulletproof glass, and bowler-hatted security guards that were trained by the British Special Forces. One of the apartments in the building was recently listed for sale at $242 million. The building itself is best appreciated at night, as it's black dark with not a light on in the building. It would appear that no one is home. It's not that the apartments haven't been sold. They've all been sold. It's just that not many of them are lived in. Out of the 86 apartments in the building, only 12 are registered in actual people's names. The rest are held in names of corporations registered in places like Cyprus, Thailand, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, Liechtenstein and the Isle of Man. The owners are wealthy and most of them don't want you to know who they are or how they got their money. Ukraine's richest man is reported to have bought two apartments in the building and merged them into one very large apartment. Another is owned by Kazakhstan's richest man, a politician who made his money in the country's notoriously corrupt natural resources sector. Apartments are allegedly owned by Russian oligarchs, Malaysian, Thai, Nigerian, Qatari and Taiwanese billionaires, but their names are not on the titles. One of the Nigerian First Lady's favourite dress designers, who was awarded 600,000 barrels of oil per month from the Nigerian oil company for being a good friend, allegedly owns five apartments in the building through a number of Isle of Man corporations. So why is so much London property owned by wealthy foreigners who don't live in the homes? And why are so many owned through offshore companies? Well, there are tax reasons that might incentivize wealthy foreigners to own UK real estate through corporate structures. The company structures might also provide asset protection, guarding wealth from angry creditors. But secrecy might be the most important reason, as these structures allow wealthy foreigners to avoid scrutiny from their home country's tax or criminal authorities. According to Transparency International, an anti-corruption advocacy group, London has a big problem with dirty money. Just before Russia invaded Ukraine, they estimated that Russians accused of corruption or having close links to the Kremlin owned $2 billion worth of property in the United Kingdom, and that front companies registered in the United Kingdom and its overseas territories and crown dependencies had concealed more than $100 billion of corrupt Russian funds. The Financial Times claims that over the past two decades, London has become one of the preferred investment locations and destinations for international oligarchs, referring to the city as the London Laundromat. To highlight how things work in wealthy parts of London, we can look at the Bishop's Avenue in North London, which is often referred to as Billionaire's Row. It's considered to be one of the wealthiest streets in the world. When Salman Rushdie was forced into hiding after writing the Satanic Verses, he moved into a house on the Bishop's Avenue. A strong security gate, fortified walls, bulletproof glass, bomb-proof curtains, and a staff of six armed security officers were installed in the house before he moved in, making it extremely safe. All of this activity went entirely unnoticed, as such activity is totally standard in parts of town like this. Rushdie spent eight years in hiding from Muslim fundamentalists on a street where ten of the houses were owned by the Saudi Arabian royal family. Anywhere else, a secretive homeowner with unusually high security would have stood out like a sore thumb. For Rushdie, Bishop's Avenue was the perfect hiding place. So what is going on in London, and is it really the money laundering centre of the world, as some people say? First up, money laundering is a serious financial crime that involves making large amounts of money generated by criminal activity appear to have come from a legitimate source. 
The money from the criminal activity is considered dirty and the process launders it to make it look clean. Money laundering underpins and enables most forms of large-scale crime, as it allows criminals to conceal their assets and enjoy the proceeds of their crimes. So how did London find itself in this position? The Suez Canal crisis in 1956 is often portrayed as having been the end of the British Empire. Dean Acheson, a former US Secretary of State, famously remarked in 1962 that Britain had lost an empire and failed to find a role. He wasn't quite right though. Britain had found a role as a centre of international finance. International investors at the time wanted to hold dollars, but for a variety of reasons didn't want to hold them in American banks. On top of that, the British government had placed severe restrictions on sterling credits to non-residents and banned the use of sterling to finance third-party transactions. To work around these issues, London banks started using dollar deposits as credit instruments for non-residents. This was the euro-dollar market, which later became the euro-money market. Storing US dollar deposits in a London bank meant that these deposits were free of the regulations imposed by the US Federal Reserve Board and the New Deal era regulations in the United States. London banks didn't have to provide and pay for FDIC insurance. They could pay higher interest rates on these deposits too, if they wanted to, as interest rates were not capped as they were in the United States. Additionally, British banks could lend these deposits to finance foreign trade, and because they weren't lending British pounds, this didn't fall under any Bank of England regulations either. Britain had found itself a role at the centre of offshore banking, which allowed for minimal regulation and provided greater freedom to move money around the world and store it away from the prying eyes of governments and financial regulators. Britain also had a web of overseas territories and crown dependencies that specialised in helping clients to hide their cash. Waves of wealthy foreigners began arriving in London around that time. Greeks arrived in the 1960s when their government was overthrown. The OPEC oil crisis of the 1970s brought in Arab money. Iranians arrived after the Iranian revolution in 1979. American bankers came in the 80s in the wake of Margaret Thatcher's financial reforms, but the biggest wave of all came after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989. The vast corrupt privatizations that occurred in the early 1990s was minting billionaires all over Eastern Europe. According to Mark Hollingsworth, the author of the book London Grad, these new billionaires saw London as the most secure, the fairest and the most honest place to park their cash. They felt sure that British judges would never extradite them either. Their money bounced through offshore tax havens like Cyprus and Gibraltar on its way into London. London wasn't necessarily where money was laundered, but it was the airing cupboard where freshly laundered money was moved for storage. London had become the place where dirty money came to party. The new arrivals didn't always just party, though. In 2006, the Piccadilly branch of Itsu, a chain of Japanese restaurants, was cordoned off by the police. Scientists inside tested for traces of polonium-210, a radioactive substance that had been used earlier that month to poison Alexander Litvinenko, a former KGB officer. From his deathbed, Litvinenko blamed Vladimir Putin for poisoning him. Polonium was eventually detected at more than 40 sites in London and beyond. British Airways advised 30,000 of their customers to contact health authorities after radioactive traces were found in two of their airplanes. 
Russian money had been pouring into London at the time. Roman Abramovich, a Russian billionaire, had bought Chelsea Football Club only a few years earlier. Oligarchs were donating money to the arts, schools, universities, and even political campaigns. A new name for the city was jokingly coined, Londongrad, an outpost in the West for Russian money. So what made and makes London so attractive to those with questionably sourced funds? Well, the same things that make London attractive to everyone else. It's a very international city where having a foreign accent doesn't make you stand out. That means that there is also a large international community to blend in with. It's a financial centre with asset management and legal expertise. There's nothing unusual about large sums of money being moved around. There's also a relaxed attitude to foreign ownership, and there's lots of luxury property to live in. There are great restaurants and high-end stores for shopping. There are also top-notch schools and universities to send your children to. And unlike in other European countries, there's no national identity card requirement, meaning that no one has the right to stop you in the street and ask to see your papers. It's only so surprising that wealthy individuals from all over the world turn up in a city like London. The problem is that not all of them will have earned that wealth honestly. A lot of countries have schemes in place that provide a fast track to residency or even citizenship for wealthy individuals who invest a defined amount of money in the country. Cyprus and Malta, for example, got in trouble with the EU in 2020 for essentially selling EU citizenship. The UK has had this type of golden investor visa scheme in place since 1994. In 2008, these visas were upgraded and rebranded as Tier 1 investor visas after the financial crisis. This restructuring went on to become an embarrassment for the government as it failed to take money laundering and other national security risks into account in its design. The main problem was that the checks that were supposed to be carried out on the visa applicants were the sole responsibility of the law firms that the applicants had hired to help them get their visas. The state had no real oversight on the more than 3,000 individuals who were granted visas during this time, leading it to be dubbed the blind fate period by Transparency International. Among the individuals known to have acquired a Tier 1 visa are the wife of a former chair of Azerbaijan's State Bank. She was the recipient of the UK's first ever unexplained wealth order when it was disclosed in court that she had spent £16.3 million at Harrods and bought £22 million worth of UK property expenditure which the British authorities said was entirely out of keeping with her husband's official salary. Obviously, the majority of people who got visas to live in the UK under programmes like this will have made their money honestly, but badly designed checks will have allowed some bad apples in with the mix. Kleptocracy is a system in which ruling elites abuse their positions or connections in government to steal public funds for their own private gain. And for this reason, much of the dirty money that we're talking about is in the hands of what are known in the financial industry as PEPs or politically exposed persons. Anyone who's on a government list of politically exposed persons is subject to extra scrutiny when moving money between financial institutions. Wealth that is beyond what can be explained with an individual's known legitimate source of wealth will raise a lot of red flags. The issue, though, is that people in political power are more easily able to gather the required documentation to show that their wealth is legitimate in their home countries, simply because they are in political power. An analysis of politically exposed persons buying property in the UK, done by Chatham House, showed that those who had fallen out of power in their home countries were caught by these rules, while those who remained in favour back home were able to tick all of the boxes. That's only so surprising. 
A real problem is that when huge wealth is acquired in countries where there's almost no rule of law and where courts are controlled by the very political figures being examined, it becomes extremely difficult to rule whether the acquisition of that wealth should be considered legal or not. A lot of the money that arrived in the UK falls into this basket where it looks quite shady but no specific law has been broken. A big issue that had been highlighted over the years was that individuals could own real estate in the UK through offshore corporate structures and not disclose the true ownership. A 2015 television documentary in the UK called From Russia with Cash showed reporters posing as wealthy Russians approaching London real estate agents wanting to buy properties using what they explained were ill-gotten gains. The agents were often very helpful, even sometimes recommending lawyers who could help the buyers hide their identities. A new register has recently been launched where the end owners of overseas companies that control land in the UK must be disclosed to Companies House. There are loopholes though. The register only applies to situations where an entity owns more than 25% of a property, and that's in line with international norms. In theory, a kleptocrat could share ownership with a few family members and avoid disclosure. A paper by Finley, Nielsen and Sharman tried to understand and explain how anonymous incorporation works internationally. The academics posed as consultants seeking confidential incorporation. They contacted incorporation services in 177 countries. About half of the sample were in the United States. Despite what you might have expected, incorporation services based in tax havens were found to comply with international standards at a much higher rate than those in the OECD countries. Tax havens don't want to be put on blacklist for crimes like this. Providers in developing countries were sometimes found to be more compliant with international laws than those in wealthy nations. The researchers found that only the risk of terrorism and the spectre of the IRS decreased offers for anonymous incorporation in the sample they contacted. UK libel law has also made London an attractive domicile for international kleptocrats and oligarchs. Reputation management firms combine legal work with public relations and even private investigator services. These firms can be used to enable corrupt individuals to silence allegations against them and hide negative media portrayals. When two Wall Street Journal reporters published a book, Billion Dollar Whale, about Joe Lowe, a Malaysian wanted for his role in a $4 billion fraud, they were surprised to learn that a London law firm was threatening libel cases against bookstores for advertising the book, claiming that a synopsis that they were publishing was defamatory. Free speech campaigners at the time were alarmed, warning that the threats risked setting a precedent that would intimidate booksellers. Media laws in England and Wales on defamation are notorious amongst investigative journalists. So too is the industry of lawyers who use the English legal system to protect the reputations of their rich and powerful clients. Prior to reform of defamation law, London's reputation lawyers relied heavily on libel to file or threaten cases against the media. Responsible journalism was given statutory protection in 2013, and claimants were required to prove serious harm. Lawyers have since turned to laws on privacy, confidentiality, and data protection to keep negative news about their clients out of the press. Reputation laundering can also involve donations to cultural institutions and universities. The Gaddafi Foundation, for example, pledged to donate £1.5 million over five years to the LSE's Centre for the Study of Global Governance, of which £300,000 were paid. In 2008, the university granted a PhD degree to the son of the Libyan leader for a dissertation. Dr. Gaddafi. This turned into a huge scandal. 
While only British citizens and companies are legally allowed to donate money to UK political parties, this group increasingly includes a number of naturalised citizens from all over the world, and of course this can be problematic. The son of a Russian oligarch and former KGB agent was controversially given a life peerage in the UK House of Lords in 2020. It was alleged by the Sunday Times that the peerage was granted despite a warning from the security services that such an appointment posed a national security risk to the country. The British government has promised to do more about money laundering, and since the Russian invasion of Ukraine has sanctioned a number of individual oligarchs. As I mentioned earlier, many of the things that attract kleptocrats and oligarchs to major cities and financial centres like London are the same things that ordinary citizens enjoy about living there. So while it makes sense to make it difficult for criminals to use the money they illegally obtain, we should be careful not to overdo it and end up with a lot of laws and regulations that require financial institutions to spy on their customers in hopes that this will enhance inhibit money laundering. The Heritage Foundation estimates that anti-money laundering regulations cost an estimated $4.8 billion to $8 billion annually in the United States alone, and that this system then results in fewer than 700 convictions annually. A number of these convictions are just additional counts against individuals charged with a list of other crimes. They calculate that each conviction costs approximately $7 million and might even cost much more. The costs of excessive regulation are passed on to law-abiding financial services customers, driving up the transaction costs that they pay and slowing down the pace of business. Banks close thousands of accounts per year of people considered suspicious, high-risk or difficult to monitor. Often they're flagged as such because they simply transfer funds to a foreign country. I often hear law-abiding individuals say that they would rather transfer funds using crypto assets due to the high cost and slow pace of transacting in the traditional financial system. That's obviously a problem. Any new regulations that are brought in should first undergo a cost-benefit analysis. There's little evidence that the higher burdens of regulation that have been put on banks over the years have done much to reduce criminality globally. The best way to deal with international criminals and the proceeds of their crimes may just be old-fashioned police work, where a person is only investigated when there's a good reason to believe they committed a crime. At that point, financial firms can hand over relevant information to authorities, rather than screening everyone searching for a needle in a haystack. New financial technology means that criminals are less likely to need to use the traditional financial system today to move wealth than at any time in the past. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the UK government, in an effort to target Putin's allies, pushed forward part of its previously discussed economic crimes legislation, which had been promised but not delivered for over five years. Golden visas to the UK have been scrapped. The new legislation includes a registry of foreign-owned property in the UK. There have been reforms in the way that unexplained wealth orders are used and improvements to the targeted sanctions regime. So will it hurt London to lose the Russian oligarch money that's been circulating in the city since the 1990s? Well, maybe not as much as you might expect. Wealthy Russians may be big spenders when they spend time in London, but Britain gets less from them than you might think. According to The Economist, in 2020, foreigners held roughly £13 billion of British assets. Russia's share of that was just 0.16%. If you enjoyed this video, you should click on this link and watch my video on how Russian oligarchs got so rich next. See you again soon. Bye.